News Hour tonight, backlash in Iran. Massive public protests are met with violence following the admission that Iran's military shot down a passenger jet. Then an impeachment trial of President Trump is imminent. As the U.S. Senate prepares for this next step, we examine the strategies being deployed by both sides. And caught stealing. Major League Baseball tries to root out cheating in the digital era. And Queen Elizabeth weighs in on Prince Harry and Meghan Markle's declaration of independence. All that and more on tonight's PBS NewsHour. Major funding for the PBS NewsHour has been provided by Fidelity Investments, BNSF Railway, American Cruise Lines, Consumer Cellular, the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation, for more than 50 years advancing ideas and supporting institutions to promote a better world at Hewlett.org. and with the ongoing support of these individuals and institutions. This program was made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. The government of Iran is under intense new pressure tonight after admitting its forces shot down a passenger airliner last week. Protests rocked the Islamic Republic through the weekend and again today. We begin with this report from foreign affairs correspondent Nick Schifrin. The Iranian regime wanted to unite the country around a general assassinated by the U.S. Instead, regime actions led demonstrators to unite in tearing him down. For three straight days, Iranians in several cities have protested their government. Cell phone videos from the capital, Tehran, show demonstrators chanting, shame on the Revolutionary Guards. Many of the protesters are students, Furious, the Revolutionary Guards accidentally shot down a passenger jet last week, killing 176 after denying it for three days. At a weekend vigil for the crash victims, a sign read, the government's lies killed us, and relatives of those killed blame the regime. We're gathered here because of some people's inefficiency, because of some people's inadequacy. Only seven days ago, hundreds of thousands of Iranians rallied around the regime and mourned Major General Qasem Soleimani, killed in a U.S. drone strike in Iraq. But this weekend, the regime turned their guns on their own people. These cell phone videos reportedly show a woman shot in the leg by police forces and a protester's blood dripped along a sidewalk. At one point, a huge crowd started running for their lives. You can hear the tear gas canisters fired at protesters by police. The protests are immediately responding to Iran's admission of guilt for shooting down the Ukrainian aircraft. Um, but I think these protests are much bigger and much larger and much more significant than simply that event. Nader Hashemi is a professor at the University of Denver. He calls these protests a reflection of previous Iranian demonstrations, including late last year, sparked by increased gas prices, and the 2009 Green Movement, when protesters called for social freedoms and the reversal of an election considered rigged. Over the last several decades, a new generation of young people have been born and raised in the Islamic Republic that have a very different vision for the future than their leaders do. Uh, these young people aspire to democracy, to greater freedoms, to human rights, um, but they're living in a deeply authoritarian system that um, is committed to denying them uh, those aspirations. President Trump encouraged the protests and warned the regime. On Sunday, he tweeted, to the leaders of Iran, do not kill your protesters. Thousands have already been killed or imprisoned by you, and the world is watching. More importantly, the USA is watching. 
The next day, President Trump retweeted an image that mocked top congressional Democrats as tools for Iran. President On Fox State News today, Press Secretary Stephanie Grisham went even further. I think the president is making clear that the Democrats are have been parroting uh, Iranian talking points and almost taking the side of terrorists. Senior administration officials also struggled to synchronize their story for why they targeted Soleimani in the days after Iranian-backed militias laid siege to the U.S. embassy in Baghdad. I can reveal that I believe it would have been four embassies, and I think that probably uh, Baghdad already started. But on CBS's Face the Nation, Secretary of Defense Mark Esper declined to repeat that. Well, the president didn't say there was a tangible, uh, he didn't cite a specific piece of evidence. What he said is he probably, he believed. Are you saying there wasn't been, one? I didn't see one with regard to four embassies. What I'm saying is I share the president's view that probably my expectation was they were going to go after our embassies. Trump administration officials tell PBS NewsHour they believe their maximum pressure campaign is working. But critics warned the policies are strengthening Iran's hardliners and the cycle of confrontation continues. The Trump administration is feeling emboldened by these protests and the Iranian government is in no mood for negotiation after the assassination of Soleimani. So, and Nick Schifrin uh, joins me now. So, Nick, we're just hearing this expert say confrontation between the U.S. and Iran likely to continue. So, is the United States interested in negotiating or not? That is the stated goal of what the U.S. has been doing in the past, but we see a subtle shift away from emphasis on negotiations. And this happened especially in a presidential tweet this weekend. Judy, we saw the president responding to a statement by the National Security Advisor suggesting that the maximum pressure campaign would force Iran to negotiate. You see that in the middle right there. The president responded, I couldn't care less if they negotiate. And by the way, he later retweeted that message in Farsi. I asked a senior State Department official about that, and the official said that our priority is getting Iran to change its behavior, stop supporting terrorism, give up ballistic missiles, end its nuclear program, and there are multiple ways for, for us to get Iran to do that. So the message from the president and this official is that we do want behavior change, but we're not necessarily going to emphasize negotiations. And that does mean the tension will increase, the U.S. believes its strategy is working, and Iran doesn't want to negotiate under the current circumstances and under this current very serious threat in Iran that we're talking about here. We not only saw the students protesting, we saw the accidental uh, arrest of a British ambassador, we saw high-profile defections, and we even saw criticism from hardline newspapers demanding resignations. So Iran does have a very serious problem with these, uh, with these protests. And meantime, uh, Nick, you had a continuing discussion over the weekend about just how imminent the threat was before General Soleimani was killed. Where does all that stand? Right so a U.S. Now? official, a U.S. official tells me that President Trump did authorize the strike on Soleimani months ago. That means that that was regardless of the current threats. But at the same time, senior administration officials tell me that he reauthorized the strike on Soleimani in the days before the strike. And so that means there are these dual instincts from the administration that reflect these dual kind of talking points. You have the Pentagon, State Department, CIA pushing for a large response against Iran in general, and then those same people seeing the scenes in Baghdad, seeing this U.S. Uh, official die uh, from an Iranian-backed militia and wanting to, as they put it, reestablish deterrence, really send Iran a strong message, and hence Soleimani was killed. The story does not go away. Nick Schifrin, thank you. Thank you. I'm Stephanie Sy at NewsHour West. We'll return to Judy Woodruff and the full program after the latest headlines. As the U.S. Senate returns to work, the impeachment trial of President Trump is starting to take shape. Tonight, our White House correspondent Yamiche Cinder reports that the White House believes at least four Republicans will vote to call witnesses. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi is expected to transmit the articles of impeachment to the Senate this week. Today, party leaders in the Senate stuck to their positions about how the trial should be conducted. The Senate was never going to pre-commit ourselves to redoing the prosecutor's homework for them, and we were never going to allow the Speaker of the House to dictate Senate proceedings to senators. So when Leader McConnell talks about precedent, he's talking about witnesses. Plain and simple. 
So the Democratic request for four fact witnesses and three specific sets of relevant documents is very much in line with our history. We'll have more on the impeachment trial after the news summary. New Jersey Senator Cory Booker suspended his campaign for the Democratic presidential nomination today. He said he could not raise the funds to continue. Booker's exit leaves a dozen Democrats still running. In economic news, tonight, the top U.S. trade negotiator Robert Lighthizer said the U.S. has gotten commitments from China on a key sticking point, currency manipulation. That's when a country devalues its currency for competitive advantage. Earlier today, the U.S. said it would no longer designate China as a currency manipulator. It's all part of a preliminary trade deal to be signed by President Trump Wednesday. In Australia, wildfire conditions eased somewhat today after a weekend of extreme winds and heat. Drone video showed charred bushland, destroyed homes, and the empty husks of cars in Victoria State. And the wildfire death toll reached 28. A volcano in the Philippines began spewing lava today, forcing thousands of people from their homes. The tall volcano is erupting about 40 miles south of Manila, the capital. Jane Deeth of Independent Television News has our report. Tall is one of the Philippines' smallest but most explosive volcanoes. It sits on an island in a lake created by a bigger volcano. The ash has risen so high, it's created its own weather including lightning. And this morning, the first lava went up, leading scientists to warn there could be an explosive eruption within the next few hours or days. People have been leaving an eight-mile danger zone. Families with babies in arms and bleary-eyed children, most of them heading for Manila, 45 miles away. We're evacuating. We've left all of our belongings. When the volcano emitted steam, we ran away. The road was crowded. Thick ash and pebbles were falling. Morning revealed ashen countryside, homes blanketed by dust. There are fears of toxic gas and if there should be an explosive mix of magma and water, the volcano could rain down shards of glass. Around 16,000 people have been evacuated so far. The president has promised to visit the area tomorrow. The fear is these are the first signs of a violent eruption. Like that in 1965. Then the Tal volcano killed hundreds. They died as they slept. This time the authorities want to get everyone to a safe distance from which to watch and wait. That report from Jane Deeth of Independent Television News. At least 54 people are dead across Afghanistan and Pakistan after winter storms brought heavy snow and flash floods. Southwestern Baluchistan, a province in Pakistan, was hardest hit when snow closed roads and collapsed roofs. Authorities in both countries struggled today to clear roads and move people to safety. Back in this country, 21 Saudi Arabian military trainees in the U.S. are being sent home after last month's shooting at a Navy base in Pensacola, Florida. Another Saudi student killed three people before being killed himself. The FBI reported today that none of the others knew of the attack in advance, but many had contact with child pornography and jihadist material. U.S. Attorney General William Barr presented the findings at a news conference in Washington. This was an act of terrorism. The evidence shows that the shooter was motivated by jihadist ideology. During the course of the investigation, we learned that the shooter posted a message on September 11th of this year stating the countdown has begun. A former pharmaceutical executive at Insys Therapeutics was sentenced to nearly three years in federal prison today after being accused of helping to fuel the national opioid epidemic. Michael Gurry and seven others at the Arizona-based company were convicted of charges related to the overprescribing of a fentanyl-based painkiller. 
Recovery efforts are underway after severe weather swept the Midwest and South, killing 11 people. Roads, cars, and homes in southeastern Oklahoma were nearly submerged by flooding rain, and tornadoes leveled homes in Alabama and South Carolina. Meanwhile, the East had record January heat. It was 72 degrees in Boston on Sunday. Still to come on the news hour with Judy Woodruff. Republicans and Democrats prepare their strategies ahead of the Senate impeachment trial. Our Politics Monday team breaks down a busy weekend on the campaign trail. Queen Elizabeth looks for ways to accommodate Prince Harry and Meghan Markle as they step back from royal duties and much more. This is the PBS NewsHour from WETA Studios in Washington and in the West from the Walter Cronkite School of Journalism at Arizona State University. Tonight, it is still up in the air exactly when the start date will be for the third impeachment trial ever of an American president. But right now, all signs point to this week, with Speaker Nancy Pelosi signaling that the articles of impeachment against President Trump will be transmitted to the Senate soon. So what will the road ahead look like? Our own Lisa Desjardins and Yamiche Alcindor are here to walk us through all of that. Hello to both of you. So much to follow once again. So, Lisa, give us the broad outline of what you're looking for this week. What, what are we expecting? It starts tomorrow bright and early when Speaker Pelosi meets with her Democratic caucus at the Capitol after they've returned to Washington. That is when we expect her to say what her plan is and when she wants to move things. Her caucus supports her, and Pelosi will probably already know that they support her. Then we'll get a formal announcement. Judy, it breaks down to a few procedural things that must happen. They must walk over the articles of impeachment after passing the names of managers in the House itself. And then the Senate can formally begin the trial. It does look like all of that can happen this week, probably not the substance of the trial, but I think within the next three days, we could certainly see the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, as he is called to do, open up this trial and read the oaths to the senators. We may not know for a few days exactly when opening statements could begin, probably next week. Uh, literally walking it over. Literally walking saying. it over from one side of the Capitol to the other. You will see the House managers all in a row walk to the Senate. And, and to Yamish now, what do we know about what the White House would like to happen? How do they want this Senate? When do they want it to begin? How do they want it to begin? Well, the president and the White House want this to begin as soon as possible because they want it to end as soon as possible. And they've been pushing for this Senate trial to be held on terms that are favorable for the president. I want to walk you through what the president's been saying, and he's been communicating on his favorite medium to communicate with people, and that is on Twitter. Here's the first tweet from this weekend. He wrote, many believe that the Senate giving credence to a trial based on, and here's a very long descriptor, no evidence, no crime, read the transcripts, no pressure, impeachment hoax, it's a mouthful, rather than outright dismissal, it gives the partisan Democratic witch hunt credibility that it otherwise does not have. I agree. Judy, that's translation for he wants all the charges to be dismissed against him. He means that he doesn't want a trial to be held at all. He also went after Nancy Pelosi, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, and House Intelligence Chairman Adam Schiff, who he, of course, has been targeting in the past. Here's what he tweeted about them. Why did nervous Nancy allow corrupt politician Shifty Schiff to lie before Congress? He must be a witness, and so should she. Now, that means that the president is saying that, one, I want the charges to be dismissed, but if we're going to have witnesses, we should have leaders in the Democratic Party do that. Of course, Republicans have also been pushing for people like Hunter Biden, the son of former Vice President Joe Biden, to come before Congress. Democrats have been pushing back against that. The bottom line here is that the White House feels as though the president is being treated unfairly and that they want a trial that essentially says, look, here are all the things that the Democrats are doing wrong. Let's talk about that. Let's put that on display. So, Lisa, when it comes to making these decisions, right. how does that get done? <laughs> Imagine, a question about decision-making at the Capitol. Um, the Senate actually has pages and pages of rules about impeachment. Some have been in place for over 100 years. Some have been in place since 1986. So what, is, what we expect to happen is after senators are sworn in formally as the jury for this trial, then they will take a vote on the starting procedure. This is what Mitch McConnell's been talking about. They will just set up opening arguments and they won't go any farther, Judy. Then after opening arguments, again, which we expect next week at this point, right. after opening arguments, the Senate will then decide what to do next. 51 senators can agree on anything to take to do next, including calling of witnesses. We could see round after round of votes. Some would fail. 
votes on Hunter Biden or not, votes on whether members of the staff at the White House should come. Anything that gets 51 votes could happen, including calling of witnesses. There is one other exception. There are some, like Senator Collins of Maine, who are trying to work out a deal so they can av avoid this sort of partisan uh, show or partisan fight that maybe the Republicans and Democrats would agree on some witnesses, not others. Right now, that feels like a long shot. And I think we won't know about witnesses until after opening statements. Trying to present, preserve some order to this, but we'll see. That's right. Keep it sort of high-minded. So, Yamish, the White House doesn't want this to happen, but how are they actually preparing to deal with it? Well, the president and White House aides have been working throughout, really throughout the, the, the week and throughout the weekend to prepare for the Senate impeachment trial. Um, they've been calling senators. They've been also beefing up the president's legal team. What's clear right now is that the White House counsel, Pat Cipollone, is going to be the lead lawyer on the president's impeachment team and, the, and his defense. But he's also now going to be bringing on Jay Sekulow. He was a personal attorney for the president. He's going to now be joining the legal staff. And there are a lot of other names floating around of people that the president might want, including former Congressman Trey Gowdy, possibly famous lawyer Alan Dershowitz. These are people that the president thinks might defend him in a way that he feels as though will show people that he's being treated unfairly. What's very clear to me is that the president is very concerned about his legacy, very concerned about the fact that he's now been impeached. And as a result, he wants to put on a very vigorous defense. I should say, Judy, I just got off the phone with a White House aide who's working directly on the impeachment strategy. And that person told me that the White House feels, feels as though it was ready before Christmas to have this Senate trial, that they feel as though that they're good, that there's more time to to prepare for this because they didn't think that they were going to have this much time to prepare a defense for the president. So that means that the White House is feeling good about the defense that they're about to put on for the president. Well, we will see because uh, it sounds like it's getting started in just a few days. Yamiche Alcindor, Lisa Desjardins, thank you. With just three weeks until Iowa's first in the nation presidential caucuses, an increasingly close race there is exposing new rifts among the candidates. Lisa Desjardins is back with this report. When millions stand up and fight back, there is nothing that will stop us. That's the Democratic presidential field still numbering in the double digits, narrowed today by one. Today, I'm suspending my campaign for president. With the New Jersey spirit, Senator Cory Booker ended a campaign that had pushed for national unity, us. just as Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders and Massachusetts Senator Elizabeth Warren abandoned their year-long non-aggression pact. I was disappointed to hear that Bernie is sending his volunteers out to trash me. I hope Bernie reconsiders and turns his campaign in a different direction. That was Warren responding to a leaked Sanders campaign script distributed to volunteers and published by Politico. It attacks Warren by charging that she appeals only to highly educated, more affluent voters, and it says that she's bringing no new bases into the Democratic Party. Elizabeth Warren is a very good friend of mine. Sanders himself denied a role in the new offensive strategy and distanced himself from the campaign volunteers involved. People sometimes say things that they shouldn't. You have heard me give many speeches. Have I ever said one negative word about Elizabeth Warren? That tension comes as new polling shows a razor-thin four-way fight in Iowa. Friday's Des Moines Register CNN poll had Sanders narrowly in the lead, earning 20 percent support from likely Democratic caucus goers, with Warren statistically tied with him. Following close behind, the former mayor of South Bend, Indiana, Pete Buttigieg, and former Vice President Joe Biden at 15. Biden topped today's Monmouth University poll with 24 percent, with Sanders, Warren, and Buttigieg tied in a close second. Thank you. Buttigieg also spent the past few days in Iowa with a Des Moines rally touting the endorsement of a prominent Iowa congressman. But the candidate also faced some controversy. I think your, your facts are a little wrong, so I'd love a chance to talk with you about it. The former mayor confronted protesters in the crowd, challenging his record on race, including on policing and housing for African-American communities. Can we agree that we can talk about this respectfully? Mm -hmm. With a number of candidates camping out in Iowa, others are putting their marks on the states that follow. Hello, Dover, New Hampshire. How are you? Entrepreneur Andrew Yang hoping for a surge in New Hampshire. Screw Iowa, 
Biden looking to cement his lead in Nevada and court Hispanic voters there. And I can assure you one thing. My cabinet, if I'm elected, and my administration will look like America. It will look like America. And former New York City Mayor Michael Bloomberg campaigning with television personality Judge Judy in Texas. Bloomberg has staked his nomination chances on the Lone Star State and others which vote in March. Judge, I am so honored to uh, have you here. Um, I'd love to tell you that I watch you all day, every day, <laughs> but I have a few other things to do. A dozen candidates still crisscrossing the country, but just six of them will face off tomorrow night in Des Moines in the seventh Democratic presidential debate. For the PBS NewsHour, I'm Lisa Desjardins. To discuss all this, I'm now joined by our Politics Monday team. That's Amy Walter of the Cook Political Report and Public Radio's Politics with Amy Walter. And Tamara Keith of NPR. She also co-hosts the NPR Politics Podcast. Hello to both of you. Hello. It is Politics Monday. There's a lot going on. We're just, what, 21 days from the Iowa caucuses. So, Amy, let's start with these polls. Friday, we have the poll come out of the Iowa Des Moines Register, a poll with Bernie Sanders on top, uh, a lot of conversation, Elizabeth Warren, Pete Buttigieg, Joe Biden, kind of bunched uh, several points behind him. But then today, there's another poll, and we're showing our viewers the Monmouth poll that has Joe Biden on top with 24 uh, percent, and then bunched behind uh, him, Bernie Sanders, Pete Buttigieg, and Elizabeth Warren. How do we What's read going on? this? Right. What's going on? You know what would the best thing to do <laughs> at this point is to say, one of those four people could win the nomination, and no one should be surprised on election night if one of those four ends up in first place. The real question in my mind is, um, you know, who has the most to lose or gain by losing, right? And so if you are Elizabeth Warren, Pete Buttigieg, and Bernie Sanders, Iowa really is a sort of slingshot for you. They are all hoping that a win in Iowa is going to give them needed momentum to overtake the person who's mm. leading in the national polls, which is Joe Biden, and to give them momentum going into New Hampshire. And maybe that's enough to undercut Joe Biden's lead nationally and in some of these states that come afterward. If you're Joe Biden, you can afford to lose Iowa, but you can't come too far back, right? It's one thing being a close second or a close third, but if you're far enough back, then suddenly the debate becomes, okay, well, if Joe Biden f flops, who's going to be able to come and take up that mantle? So, and, and, uh, and, and Tam, we have, I mean, it, as we said, it is 21 days right. <laughs> between now and so who knows what could happen. Right. But are we seeing the shape of this race? or not. We have pretty consistently seen those four people at the top. Right. Now, there's been a lot of movement uh, in that top pack, but pretty consistently, they've been the top four. And, you know, the, the caucuses are this fascinating thing in Iowa, where, as, as you both know very they well, are. they <laughs> they go to gymnasiums, they go to big rooms. And if a candidate isn't viable in that room, then, then people are persuading their neighbors. So, Second choice matters a lot in Iowa, and and the fact that they are all so close and that so many voters say they haven't really decided and they could support other people, it just puts a lot of volatility in, into this race. And it means that whatever we're talking about for the next three weeks is going to matter. What we're talking yes. about the yes. week before voting matters a lot. Are we talking about impeachment? Are we talking about Iran? Are we talking about health care? That can fit into one of the those various candidates' wheelhouse or something that's a, more of a problem for them. More of a problem. Well, one yeah. person we're not going to be talking about is Cory Booker. Right. He showed up, uh, I guess, seventh in, in the Iowa poll, Des Moines Register poll, sixth in the Monmouth poll. But, Amy, uh, what do we know about what was behind his decision? Well, what he said was behind it is what we, he said sort of publicly all along, which was, I've had a lot of trouble <laughs> raising the money that you need yeah. to keep yeah. a national campaign going. But I think what it really speaks to is how difficult it is to break through, even as a well-established political figure here in Washington, into a field that has, was so crowded, but with two really big names. Everybody knows who Joe Biden is. Everybody knows who Bernie Sanders is and what their brand is, right? You know what you get with Joe Biden. You know what you get with Bernie Sanders. Breaking through with your own unique message and identity is a lot harder 
than it looks. And this is what's really remarkable. Here we are, three weeks away from Iowa. We have a part Democratic Party that yeah. is all about, and their voters are, women, they're women, voters of color, younger voters, and at top of the polls are three older white folks right. and, th and three white men and only one woman. And only one being, being Elizabeth Warren, Amy right. Klobuchar are still trying very hard right. uh, in Iowa. And, and in the meantime, all this is going on, uh, Tam, you have this, I guess, sniping, you could call it, uh, that, that's surfacing between Bernie Sanders and on the one hand, a little bit with Joe Biden over his Iraq war vote, but then new sniping between him and Elizabeth Warren. Uh, it, 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 does that, what does that say to you about Bernie and, well, and Elizabeth? Well, I mean, there was a non-aggression pact, and it seems <laughs> that the non-aggression pact has been broken. Uh, and and it, I think it's not a coincidence that the sniping is happening right ahead of this last debate before the caucuses. Uh, this is a, a critical moment. And you know, they're, they're sniping at each other in relatively nice ways, mostly talking, the candidates themselves sort of talking about how they're disappointed in the other candidates' <laughs> campaign and how disappointing this all is. But it does point to the fact that, um, that Elizabeth Warren is a candidate who stands in the way of, of Bernie Sanders being able to completely consolidate right. progressive support. And yeah. if you look at the field, there's a, definitely a split. There are progressive candidates and there are more moderate uh, establishment candidates, and if you add them up, they're about equal numbers. Um, Bernie Sanders, as a as a candidate in a campaign, sees a path potentially to winning the nomination or at least oh, gaining yeah. a whole lot of momentum. And and Elizabeth Warren is someone who, more than any other candidate, stands in that path. If they're going to distinguish themselves, Amy, they they need to do it quickly, don't they? Soon. Yes, <laughs> and I think they they have distinguished themselves. Yes. Clearly, people know who they are and what they stand for. The the challenge is they haven't been able to, as Tam pointed out, nobody's been able to really consolidate that sort of progressive wing. And so I doubt you're gonna see a fight between them on the debate stage. It doesn't do either of them any good to get in a public fight there. Um, but what you will see going into the caucuses is each of them trying to put the debate on terms the debate of, not of the debate of the actual standing on stage, but the, what Democrats are talking about is what they are comfortable talking about. Elizabeth Warren wants this to be a debate about the economy. Bernie Sanders would love to be talking about health care. And Joe Biden, of course, would love to be talking about experience. Well, one, uh, one other figure who's not going to be on the debate stage is President Trump, Tam, but he is tweeting like mad and mm -hmm. belittling. I mean, it's more than, than sniping. I, I, you know, it, tough, you know, he talked about, he made fun of, basically, of, of Cory Booker dropping out. He calls Mike Bloomberg mini Mike Bloomberg. He talks about, uh, po he's still talking about Elizabeth Warren as Pocahontas. Can the candidates just essentially ignore this? But they largely have been. Uh, you know, President Trump has a nickname for everyone. He had a nickname for everyone in 2015, 2016. Um, I, I would say get used to the tweeting. It's going to continue. There's nothing that's going to change about it. He wants to be part of the conversation. He is injecting himself, trying to inject himself into the conversation. I mean, we're talking about him right now. Also, another sign of that, uh, he has announced a rally the Thursday before the caucuses in Des Moines. We saw that. Yeah. Do we have and time for one more no. thing? No. Okay. You're have to hold next it. week. <laughs> next next <laughs> week, I'll make it. You can tweet about it. <laughs> That's what I'll do. Amy Walter, Tam Key. Thank you very much. You're okay. welcome. <laughs> <laughs>
they crisscross the city serving evictions. I get there and people want to curse me out, but I understand that. So you got to give you got to give them that chance to vent because you know you they're losing their home, their home. It's a scene that unfolds in Richmond more often than almost anywhere else in the country. And those evictions can stay on a renter's record for at least a decade. In the city of Richmond, there are roughly 18,000 eviction lawsuits filed every year. Marty Wegbright is an attorney at the Central Virginia Legal sure. Aid Society, a nonprofit that represents and advocates for low-income tenants. He says Richmond's eviction rate spiked for many reasons. We have a shortage of affordable housing. We have a poverty rate of 25 percent in the city. We have gentrification. We have a history of racial segregation, state-sponsored racial segregation. So it's all of those factors combined. Virginia has long been considered a friendly state for landlords, with a host of laws that make it cheap, quick, and relatively easy to evict tenants. The filing fee to file an eviction lawsuit in Virginia is $58. By comparison, in Alabama, it's $250. But you that know, ease Christmas also stuff, extracts yeah. a real toll on the people being evicted. So Letitia Lee school? is a single mother who lives mm -hmm. in public housing in Richmond. When you get that knock on the door, what is that like? It's scary. Like your heart will drop and you don't know what to do. And like in my case and most a lot of other people's cases, they don't have nowhere else to go. Like where they're at is where they depend on to lay their head every day. Lee works seven days a week as a home health aide, feeding, <laughs> bathing, and caring for elderly clients. But even so, she says she's constantly afraid she won't have enough to pay her rent. They'll put it on your door and just walk away, and sometimes... Um, That's the notification on the door that says you're being evicted. Mm -hmm. Get out. They'll give you a certain, like, they'll let you know, like, if you still haven't paid this by this day, then you have to be gone within a matter of this time and the sheriff will be there. And, and it happened to me like three or four times. Lee says she's always been able to come up with enough money to avoid eviction, but she says her family is still living right on the edge. Okay, take a big breath. Go. <sighs> they had to recently move for a more pressing issue. Her last place made her son Nishan's asthma much worse. He do the inhalers, he do treatments, he do a flow naze, and then he has um, actual medicine he takes. It's a lot for a four-year-old. Yeah, but he didn't got used to it. He knew how to do it all by himself. She says their old apartment had rats, and the walls and air vents were covered in mold. My doctors even said we can't be in the apartment. We got to leave because it's a health hazard. The majority of low-income renting families in the U.S. spend over 50 percent of their income on housing. That's according to Princeton's Eviction Lab. And according to Catherine Howell and Ben Teresa of Virginia Commonwealth University, that often forces families to accept substandard housing after they've been evicted. This is a problem that is disproportionately felt by black people, and in particular, black women. The pair has spent the last few years mapping exactly where evictions are happening in Richmond. When you look at the preponderance of unsafe and unfit structures, uh, you see a lot of overlap in the neighborhoods where we have high, high eviction rates. We also have high numbers of code violations in these buildings. It really is where you live that actually may be the most important part of your health. Stay still. Dr. Megan Sandal is a pediatrician at Boston Medical Center who has written extensively on the links between housing and health. She led a team of researchers who interviewed more than 20,000 families in five cities. We found that those families that were homeless and the families that were behind on rent had very similar adverse health outcomes, which signaled to us that homelessness is bad, but behind on rent is just as bad for kids' health and their parents. A 2018 report out of Seattle found that mental health was the most commonly cited complaint of those facing eviction, including varying levels of depression, anxiety, and insomnia. And even for families not facing eviction, housing instability can be just as detrimental. I have to continue to make believe that everything's okay. Back in Richmond, Carmen Condelario has been living paycheck to paycheck for years. She now works two jobs, a translator for a local hospital and a hotel banquet server. And my pictures had the, the dots everywhere. 
the mold growing on your pictures. Yeah. So kind of she and her daughter have moved four times in the last right eight here. years because she says the homes oh, were all unsafe to live in. A little over a year ago, she moved into this rent-subsidized apartment, but almost immediately, her 12-year-old daughter, Amida, started having health problems. She had a lot of breathing problems. She had a lot of um, hives. Um, she had a lot of fever, shortness out of breath, which I thought was due cause to asthma, but we were allergic to the apartment. Candelario complained about what she said was frequent mold and dampness in the apartment, but she claims the landlord ignored her. She believes it's still making her daughter sick and says it's caused a new problem for her. So last year she missed out 27 days of school. Um, within that 27 times of her being absent, I also called out 27 times. So that you could be home with her when and she's And taking sick. her to her doctor's appointments and picking her up from school. I'm on my last lifeline because if I continue to call out due to health issues, I am fired. Last fall, Richmond's mayor, LeVar Stoney, unveiled a pilot program to help about 500 families avoid eviction over the next year. The program set aside nearly half a million dollars to help tenants pay overdue rent. Housing is foundational. It's the vaccine to poverty. And so if you are able to have a safe, quality roof over your head, uh, and then that gives you the ability to put food on the table, uh, that's going to help you rise up that economic ladder. Meanwhile, Leticia Lee says she's tired of having to live in places that she says make her son sick, but she can't afford anything better right now. Does he understand any of the stuff that's going on? I don't think he does. He just knows he's tired of being sick. <laughs> that's all he could tell me is, Mommy, really? I don't want to be sick no more. <laughs> For the PBS NewsHour, I'm William Brangham in Richmond, Virginia. The British monarchy is in the midst of one of its most tumultuous times in recent memory. And today, Queen Elizabeth said she would be open to a new arrangement that would allow Prince Harry and Meghan Markle to pursue a life outside their royal obligations. The statement followed an extraordinary meeting today. On the Navaz fills in the picture. Judy, the Queen's statement was released after meeting with her heir, Prince Charles, and her grandsons, Princes William and Harry. The statement read, quote, Although we would have preferred them to remain full-time working members of the royal family, we respect and understand their wish to live a more independent life as a family while remaining a valued part of my family. Joining us now from London to discuss this and what's ahead for Meghan and Prince Harry's future is Robert Lacey. He's a historian on the royal family and a consultant to the Netflix series, The Crown. Robert Lacey, welcome to the News Hour. I want to ask you if you can just start us off with some context here. How big a deal is it that there are members of the royal family who are intentionally, deliberately trying to take a step back from this institution? Um, it's very significant. I think it's a moment to rank with the Annus Cerebralis, which was the fancy Latin name for all the disasters in the 1990s, with the royal marriages going wrong and Windsor, fire, the Windsor Castle burning. Perhaps even the abdication of 1936, because actually, if it doesn't work out, Prince Harry and Meghan have expressed their intention of abdicating. And in that sense, you could say um, this meeting and coming together and urgency was a result of a certain sort of blackmail. Well, let's talk a little bit about what we do know, which is still very early in, in stages in terms of how this arrangement will play out. What, what do you know, based on the people you've talked to, about how this kind of arrangement might even work? Based on people I've talked to, I think it's got every chance of, of working. Um, uh, we've heard today confirmation that the Sussexes will settle in Canada, at least for a period of transition, um, while they work out... Uh, how they are going to do the other thing that's in the statement. They do not want to be reliant on public funds. That is really a key over here. Taxpayers' money is, is, is the refrain that gets repeated. Every British taxpayer pays about £1.24 or so, what's that, $1.50 in their taxes, goes every year to the royal family. That might seem a small sum for all the fun and pleasure they give us, and it also actually 
is a small sum for the billions, literally billions, they bring in in tourist revenue. But um, this issue has got the country pretty divided. Well, let me ask you about the way that Harry and Meghan presented this when they made the announcement. They said, and I'm quoting from their original statement, they want to carve out a progressive new role within this institution. So can the two coexist, a progressive new role within this institution that traces its roots to medieval times? The strength of the royal family is its ability to adapt to change, its realization that it's got to represent the values of the people that it's supposed to represent. My prediction, based on what I've heard, is that this tricky question of the money, so that the British taxpayer doesn't feel aggrieved, is going to be solved by some sort of huge American foundation. I would predict that the creation of a big uh, Sussex Royal Foundation in America. It will fund all their ac good activities and their, their crusading activities in North America and around the world. And what's going to... This is not the end of the story. They're, they're now, for the next few days, going to haggle over the details. And the sort of details they'll be talking about will be, well, what are you going to crusade for in your new um, foundation? Fine to get involved in community development racial equality. Um, once you stray into women's politics um, and that sort of area, maybe that will be trespassing on the traditional and very important political and social neutrality of the royal family. Robert, I would be remiss if I didn't ask you about a lot of the reports and analysis we've seen in the days since the announcement by Meghan and Harry that what was underlying their decision was also the disproportionate criticism Meghan received and a lot of it fueled by some very real racism in Britain. What do you make of that? It's quite true. Um, there was terrible racism on the Internet, uh, in social media, but also the British tabloids subjected Meghan to the sort of hazing that all royal women have to go through cruelly when they join the royal family. Kate went through it, Harry's... Uh, sorry, um, William's wife. Camilla went through it. Um, so that's a real grievance, understandable. From Harry's point of view, there's been this existence of a rift we've just discovered that has been marring his relationship with his brother, William, for 18 months now. And so that's why Harry himself was not averse to going and undoubtedly supported his wife in her, in her wish. Is this a sense of how sort of the modern monarchy can now work? Is this a model for the future? My view is that it is a very positive model for the future. Um, just at the time we're leaving Europe, and the government's looking across the Atlantic, here's the royal family actually ahead of them. And the British royal family has, in a way, almost despite itself, reinvented itself again. That is Robert Lacey, historian of the royal family, joining us tonight from London. Thank you very much. Thank you. Baseball is a game of traditions, but the Major League Baseball commissioner made clear today that teams may not use 21st century techniques to carry out one age-old practice, decoding the signs opposing catchers use to communicate with pitchers. John Yang has the details on the cheating scandal. Judy, Major League Baseball said today that in the 2017 season, when they won the World Series, the Houston Astros used an elaborate system to tell batters what pitch was coming. It involved a video camera in center field at their home stadium, a monitor near the dugout, and banging on a trash can. As a result, Commissioner Rob Manfred today suspended General Manager Jeff Lunau and Field Manager A.J. Hinch for the 2020 season. Later, team owner Jim Crane took it even further when he fired them. We want to be known as playing by the rules. Um, we broke the rules. We accept the punishment. Uh, and we're going to move forward. It's very unfortunate. Neither one of those guys implemented this or, or pushed it through the system. It really came from the bottom up. Um, it's pretty clear in the report um, how that happened. Um, but neither one of them uh, did anything about it. And, and that's unfortunate. And the consequences are severe. Manfred also fined the Astros $5 million, the most allowed, and stripped the team of their two top picks in the 2020 and 2021 drafts. Additionally, he handed down a one-year suspension from baseball to a former Astros assistant general manager, Brandon Taubman, for a tirade directed at female sports reporters 
during last year's playoffs. Dave Scheinan covers baseball for the Washington Post, and he joins us from the Post newsroom. Dave, runners on second have traditionally tried to decode the signals that the catchers were sending their, their pitchers. As a matter of fact, whenever a, a, a runner reached second base, the catchers would always change it up a little bit. So why is this different, and why this big response from the commissioner? Well, there's a number of things. Uh, number one, I think baseball does not want some sort of digital arms race going on in baseball to see which team could, could come up with the fanciest new equipment to, to decode signs. Um, but secondly, it's also created uh, longer games uh, because catchers now have to go through these intricate system of signs and change them up um, from inning to inning or, or uh, day to day or even batter to batter uh, to combat this espionage. So it's created longer games. Um, and, 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 you know, it, it just, um, the last thing baseball needs is people to question uh, the outcome of games, especially World Series games, when one team um, has better digital equipment than the other. A longer game, something that Major League Baseball is really trying to fight against. Now, in the report, the commissioner said this was largely a player-driven system that coaches, other than Alex Cora, who's now was bench coach of the Astros then, now manager of the Boston Red Sox, uh, were not really involved. But at the same time, he said he's not punishing any players. Why is that? Well, there's a couple of things. First of all, I think that um, it's generally assumed that players on a team are going to talk to each other constantly about deciphering pitchers' movements, pitch tipping. Um, if they pick up on a catcher's sign from second base, they may bring that information back to the dugout and confer with teammates, and that's just been part of baseball forever. Um, the fact that the Astros ratcheted this up a step um, is more indicative of a culture of permissiveness uh, with the Astros. And that, I think, more than anything, is what baseball is coming down on. If you read the uh, statement, there was a, a couple of paragraphs that were some very pointed criticism about the Astros' culture as instilled by the general manager, Jeff Lunau, and the manager, A.J. Hinch. And that's where, uh, according to Rob Manfred, um, you know, the responsibility for this falls. Alex Cora, we talked about. He's now manager at the Boston Red Sox. Uh, the commissioner's office is investigating a similar sign-stealing system at the Red Sox in 2018 when he took over. The commissioner said he hasn't decided the penalty yet because that investigation isn't over. What do you think we should expect when that comes down against Alex Cora? Right. Well, I think that given Cora's clear involvement uh, as a participant or even an instigator of the Astros scheme and the evidence that the Red Sox in 2018 under Cora uh, were using a similar scheme, I would think that the punishment would have to be at least as severe as what was handed down to Hinch. Uh, which is a one-year suspension, and then it's up to the Red Sox to decide whether they're going to fire their manager in the same way the Astros did. Um, I think everybody in the game is, is expecting that punishment to be at least as severe as Hinch's. Dave, how much of a black mark against baseball is this? Well, you know, that's a, that's a fascinating question. I mean, you know, ba baseball, like all major sports, is seeing... Um, an increase and an influx in gambling, uh, the legalization of gambling um, f throughout the country is, is part of the, the, the equation here because um, the integrity of the game and the individual games and the outcomes has never been more important than it is in the era of, of legalized gambling. So this uh, is a major black mark on the sport. I mean, to me, it's the largest cheating scandal in baseball since the Bobby Thompson 1951 New York Giants that won the pennant, uh, and their players admitted decades later after the fact that they had been stealing signs with binoculars and a system of buzzers. This is as big as that, if not bigger. Dave Shiner of the Washington Post, thanks very much. Thank you. Fascinating story. On the news hour online right now, people from all around the world united to lend some comfort or try to to Australia's wildlife amid those deadly fires. Thousands of rescue items have been made and sent, but some handmade donations may not be right for the animals in need. You can learn more on our website, pbs.org newshour.
And that is the news hour for tonight. I'm Judy Woodruff. Join us online and again here tomorrow evening for all of us at the PBS News Hour. Thank you, and we'll see you soon. Major funding for the PBS News Hour has been provided by On an American Cruise Line's journey along the Mississippi River, travelers explore classic antebellum homes, Civil War battlefields, and historic American towns. Aboard our fleet of Victorian-style paddle wheelers and modern riverboats, you can experience local culture and cuisine and relive American history. American Cruise Lines, proud sponsor of PBS NewsHour. Fidelity Investments. BNSF Railway. Consumer Cellular. And by the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, supporting science, technology, and improved economic performance and financial literacy in the 21st century. Supported by the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, committed to building a more just, verdant, and peaceful world. More information at macfound.org. And with the ongoing support of these institutions, This program was made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. This is PBS News Hour West. From WETA Studios in Washington and from our bureau at the Walter Cronkite School of Journalism at Arizona State University.